I think any positive shift you can make for yourself is helping you live a better life. And you should do every little positive shift you can. Um, they're worth it. Even the small ones. I know Heather's a, a big proponent of like small habits and those are, they help. So just shift little things and those little things be, will become bigger things. Attracting profit. If you are a female founder or business owner, this is for you. I am only opening my calendar in the month of September for one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's called Attracting Profit Intensives. You and I are going to be hanging out and showing you how to scale, whether it's personally or professionally, so you can attract more clients, more of what you want, more time, more energy, reverse engineer, both personally and professionally. So you're going to get me in your back pocket. We're going to pull back the curtains. I'm going to share my resources with you. I'm going to save you so much fucking time and money. And we're going to focus on where you want to go and clear those blocks. So attracting Profit one on one coaching. If you're interested, head on over to Heather Chauvin, C H A U V I N dot com forward slash work with me. Heather Chauvin dot com forward slash work with me. This is your time to make magical shit happen very quickly. Attracting profit. Go fill out the application and we'll be in touch. It was late at night. They had paged the on-call cardiologist because I had gone into AFib again. How did I end up here? It was hard to comprehend that just two days ago, I had been drinking mimosas at brunch with my best friends in Sonoma County, and now I was hospitalized in Michigan. The attending walked into the room, tall, confident, she looked like she was a mom too. She looked at me and asked how I was feeling. I answered, I've been better. She paused, looking at me empathetically. I know, you were doing everything right, weren't you? You were bouncing around from mom thing to next mom thing, doing your yoga, and then something just went off balance. And here you are. You were doing everything right. I cried the minute she left the room. I was doing everything right, but my body is complex, as many doctors call it, and something in it had clearly shifted. She spoke out the words that had been playing in my head over and over. As I sat in the emergency room only the day before, I waited 14 hours to be seen. Why was that? Well, because I was not showing severe outward symptoms. I knew something was very wrong though. Trust me, I do not just go to the ER for anything. But when a doctor finally did see me, I was in serious trouble with my kidneys shutting down. If I had not finally advocated for myself in the ER, I would have waited much longer. I live my life advocating and taking steps to improve my own health instead of waiting for the next challenge. And that works most of the time. But in this specific circumstance, my help had landed me in a pretty critical situation and no one could explain why. Not the cardiologists, not the nephrologists, not the hematologists. They literally told us that due to my complex anatomy, this must have happened. Not very reassuring and calming as you can imagine. Of course, my mind wanted to blame myself, but I knew that the only way out of this was through, and so I got to work forgiving myself and moving on. The attending who acknowledged that with me helped bring me back to myself. I have learned that the attitude and effort I put into my physical and mental recovery is critical to living with gratitude and remembering that big picture of life. 
and I had a lot of things on my bucket list yet. So it was time to learn, listen to the doctors and start the healing process so I could. Thank you. I was smiling during your story because you said something about like, and trust me, I wouldn't be in the ER. And I was like, you know, it's bad if Jessica advocates for herself to be in the ER. Yeah. Because you were one, well, people <laughs> probably say tough cookie, all the things people say, right? Stubborn, <laughs> blah, 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 yes. whatever they call yes. us, right? Um, so <clears throat> let's talk about that. Do you want to give just a little Cole's Notes version of, you know, you kept saying unique anatomy or um, a little background of your sure. health history? So I was born um, with a very severe congenital heart defect which I lived with for 17 years. Um, and the doctors re repaired my heart as much as they could. And then at age 17, there was nothing more they could do for my own heart. So I had a heart transplant and I've been living with that heart transplant for 27 years now. And how long ago did this in particular story take place? It was October of 2019, so not too long ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is your health today? Um. Outwardly, you would again think nothing's wrong with me, but um, I am in advanced heart failure again and um, waiting to be listed for a second heart transplant. Yeah, you're, we're recording this. You're at work, just yep. <laughs> doing your thing. And, you know, I'm watching you on Instagram in the summer, just traveling with your family, mm -hmm. with your boys. Yep. And you, My life. you feel good. I do. Yeah. yeah. That's the kind of crazy thing is the juxtaposition of having this diagnosis that I'm in advanced heart failure and yet living, you know, like I'm not sick at all. So yeah, it's kind of hard to wrap my, my head around. So I know that some people listening will be like, okay, I can't relate because I haven't been in that health crisis. And I'm sure like me, you're like, well, please don't get there. <laughs> but I can see a through line of, we all have hard days. We all have emotionally uncomfortable moments and you're not, although what the doctors are telling you, you're physically still able to live your life. And so Let's talk about that. Like not only the, how to get through the challenges in your mind, you're talking about um, attitude and effort, but like how knowing that you're in this, I want to call it purgatory, but like in this awkward in between phase where you're like, I still need to live my life. I still mm. need to take care of myself and I'm still living with the fear of uncertainty and the unknown. So what, what the fuck? Like, how do you do that? So um, I kind of right now have taken the road of I'm going to make myself as healthy as I possibly can because I know that my body's about to experience significant trauma and obviously, you know, something that I'll have to get through, get through physically. Um, so I've been kind of doubling down and, um, you know, my doctor tells me not to work out, but I've been taking walks. Uh, doing as much as I can, doing some strength training, um, you know, really focusing on my nutrition. And I know that sounds a little crazy, but it gives me a little bit of control to yeah. um, help myself be in the best place I can be, knowing that at some point I'm going to hand over that trust to the medical professionals to get me through so I can be even healthier. Um, and also like mentally saying, you know, what are my three top priorities? Well, priority number one is my health. And if I want my health, you know, I'm going to have to get through this next challenge as well. So mm -hmm. that's part of the road to being healthy. So I know you've been in my world for a little while. I've kicked your ass a few times. <laughs> um, and now you don't have an option to say, I don't have time. Yeah. So let's talk about that because everybody listening to this, myself included, when we feel amazing, we don't have time for those daily habits. So talk about that. Like, what is your relationship with time and those things that you know you need to do to build yourself up? 
Yeah. So I think it's, you know, I was just talking to my husband the other day and I was like, oh my God, we're so busy now. And I've had to set some boundaries because I need space to kind of clear my head about my health and what's going on. Um, so I think it gives me permission to do that without feeling guilty. Um, you know, like I went to Reiki last Thursday and then my cousin came over for dinner, but I was like, you can't come over until 6 PM because I got to do this for myself. And like, that is number one priority. So it, it's easier, I think, in my case, because I know I have to put it first. But, um, you know, there's still days where I'm like, not putting it first, and then have to sit back and say, hey, you know, this is, this is important. And there's days when I'm a mess too, right? Like I'm lucky that more days I'm not a mess than the days I am a mess. But I'm not going to lie. Like this isn't easy peasy either. Yeah. So I want to talk about fear and I'm going to make you emotionally uncomfortable. What's your biggest fear? Having a second heart transplant is my biggest fear. And I'm going to have to live through that. And there's a lot of things, you know, when I think back on that time, when I was 17 years old, I actually think about it very positively because I push down the bad parts of it, but I know that the bad parts I'm going to have to live through as well. So, um, you know, I've been trying, like I actually made a list. I made a list of things I have to finish before I can have heart transplant. And I did that so I can be like, okay, I'm ready now. Right. When that list, and obviously, you know, I'm a list person, but when that list's checked off, there can't be any more procrastination because I've done everything I need to do um, for the next step. But the, I mean, there's a lot of trauma response that comes up in me when I think about yeah. being in the hospital for weeks on end and things like that. I think a lot of times too, people get bad raps for their trauma responses and their coping strategies. But when you think about it in reality, when you look at people and I'm using air quotes are successful Mm -hmm. or they call it grit, or they call it perseverance. It, like I know for myself, people shame me for my trauma responses. And I'm like, my trauma responses, one, not only have kept me alive, but two have made me thrive. So yeah. if I can balance my trauma response, which is like hyper independence, um, compartmentalization, like, you know, the only way out is through. I'm like, I got to face this shit. I'm not, I can't, I don't have the opportunity to avoid it. Right. So, I mean, there's many trauma responses, but when you can learn to use them in a healthy way, of course, while you're healing, we don't need to attach shame to it. So yeah. when you are there, Jessica, and you're sitting in that moment, cause I can recognize it in myself. You're so triggered, paralyzed in fear. How do you mentally unhook yourself from the fear or guilt or shame and choose to like focus your energy and attention on the action that is required instead of staying stuck in the fear? I think for me, um, I have to understand that I'm, it's a resistance. Like I have to be in that moment and be like, crap, I'm, it's a, this is resistance. This is resistance. And I have to bring myself kind of off that ledge. Um, and remember that I've done this before and I'll do it again. Um, and that there's a lot of people who are going to support me through this process. And they're not only medical professionals, but like also my family and extended support network. But I think just realizing it's happening and your thoughts are creating so much more emotion than needs to be there as the first step in coming back. I like what you just said, realizing that your thoughts are creating so much more emotion than there needs to be like the added drama. Yeah. Yeah. Like anytime I'm making a subtle shift, I'm so dramatic. And in my head, most of the time it doesn't come out. Mm -hmm. I've learned how to like keep my mouth shut but then I get very emotional and then I'm like, oh, I'm having a day and you wallow in your pity and all of that. So how do you choose like 
like, what are you feeling on the daily? Like, can you feel joy? Can you feel gratitude? How do you get there? I think I feel more gratitude, to be honest. Like I, I really do. Um, I think I am more aware of all of the little things and those things are the things that I'm really cherishing. Um, so it's easier for me to feel joy right now because it's, you know, the really simple things like my kids, even though they drive me nuts sometimes, like they bring me so much joy. And so I'm able to be so grateful for every moment right now that I get to spend with them. Um, you know, being up North, sitting in front of a lake and just saying, God, it's beautiful. Like who created all of this? I think the joy moments come a lot more easily right now than they would have, you know, four years ago when I was kind of taking things for granted, not, you know, like just living life. Um, so yeah. It's almost like busyness is a privilege. Yes. Yeah. The privilege of health, the privilege of not having to focus like so hyper-focused on certain things that we, we take a lot of things for granted. Yes, we do. We really do. I remember uh, one time I came home from the hospital and my counts were really low. It reminds me of COVID. So I'm sure lots of people have had this experience, but like I was in a restaurant. Um, It was the first time I went into a restaurant after isolation. Mm -hmm. And I was with my husband and I started crying and he was like, what is wrong? And I said, you have no fucking idea how grateful I am for this opportunity. I was crying. And he's like, are you okay? I said, no, because you don't get it. And I looked around the room and I was like, nobody here understands the privilege that they have right now. And so I think we felt that a little bit in the last few years, but yeah, we did. And then it's like, and then it goes away. Like your brain goes. Yeah. Just, just this, the things that you're talking about fear, like the things that I'm you know, really not looking forward to going to the hospital or like not being able to prepare my own food. Like that song, not being able to take my supplements. Like you lose complete control when you're in the hospital. Right. And people don't realize that who haven't been in the hospital for long periods of time, but you totally relinquish control and have very little, you know, choice because you're healing, you're in a healing environment and they're trying to just get you healthy. But you know, that for somebody who's kind of a control freak, it's very hard to just let go. I attract a lot of those. (laughs) Like, here's the thing. I tell people like, you're like, I'm a control freak. I'm type A. And I'm like, yeah. And you get shit done. It's when, you know, when people are, have no controlling tendencies, you're like, whoa, can you just care a little bit? Like you're too lax. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to find the messy middle, which is like compassion. And when things don't go our way, how can we be a little flexible, all of that fun stuff. And yes, when we're trying to control externally, it's because we feel out of control internally. So how do you, do you have to force yourself to like come back to reality on the daily rather than compartmentalizing it and just forgetting it until a doctor's appointment or something? So a lot of it comes to me at night, um, in the quiet and I, I do compartmentalize a lot. Like it's easier to do that, but I've also tried to create space for just some reflection. And so, um, I have this little like ritual that I go down in my sauna and I listen to meditation and I kind of try to allow myself to get those thoughts out before I go to bed. Um, and that helps, but I think, you know, and you taught me this other, if I don't create space for it, it's just going to well up in me. Um, so creating little rituals where I have that, you know, space to do it kind of like a little date with myself to grieve over some things, um, really helps and keeps me more, um, like stable, like just kind of even keeled through the week. So I just heard you say grieve. Yeah. Have you been, so are you one, I'm very proud of you. 
two, it sounds like you're starting to grieve what you know is coming. Where normally, traditionally, we're taught grieve after it's gone. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I don't know why, but um, I have to come to terms with the fact that this is going to happen, and so I need to grieve some of the feelings I've had about never wanting this to happen. So it needs to come out before I can, because I have to mentally be at the top of my game when I have the surgery, because I have to mentally get through it. So if I'm not where I need to be from a mental space perspective, um, that's not going to happen. You know, it's interesting. And I don't know if this, because this is in my consciousness lately, but I've told you this before many times, I don't identify as an athlete. Mm -hmm. And then last week I did a half marathon uphill. That one, you wouldn't even be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was like, I remember when I was on the hill, when I wanted to give up and I kept saying, this is a privilege and it's going to make me cry. I'm like, this is a privilege. There was a time in your life when you could not do this. This is a privilege. This is a privilege. And I kept doing that. I'm like, it's a privilege to have this pain and discomfort. And then, of course, there was other moments where they were like, we actually had silent time. It was like, think about the person that you're doing this for, like your bigger why. Mm -hmm. And I don't identify as an athlete, but I can identify as a mental athlete. Yeah. And I think that's where all the athletic tendencies are is in the mind, how you can take a thought or a feeling and say, and have a boundary with it and be like fear, not today, not right now, right now I'm focused on gratitude. So you go over here. Yeah. So how, and it's a practice, but how have you found yourself? Maybe when this, you know, you first got the, um, I don't want to say diagnosis, but when you first, the doctors were like, this is, this is happening. And you're mm -hmm. like in denial about it. The practice of like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. What have you noticed of your evolution, your mental athletic tendencies? Yeah. Um, I've realized that trust is something that's important and knowing as much as I possibly can. So like information gathering is very important to me. And then um, I'm having the surgery when I have it at a hospital I'm not familiar with because it's so specialized. Mm -hmm. um, so like trying to get to know the people there um, helps me, again, feel a little bit more prepared to go into it. Um, I don't know, like we were talking about being an expert, like kind of being an expert in what's going to happen to me and um, knowing as much as I can, knowing also that I have to be really flexible. And if they tell me in two weeks, I'm there, like I'm there and I'm going to have to drop everything and people are not going to understand that around me, right. but I'm going to have to completely remove myself from everybody else's, you know, feelings about it and focus on me. Um, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. How, because that's a lot, what holds people back in life, right? Fear of judgment, fear of other people's mm -hmm. thoughts, feelings, all of that. It doesn't matter if it's your health, a relationship work. How do you cope when you're sitting there and you might say something to somebody and you can feel their projection onto you, whether it's fear or somebody, or maybe someone does not project their poop onto you. How do you energetically process that? I, I, I sit in it, I guess. Um, I know that many people who have not gone through a medical challenge, they don't under, they, they just don't get it and that's okay. Right. They, they, how could they, mm -hmm. um, so I don't expect them to, but I also know that, you know, I'm not going to be able to explain everything to everybody in a way that that's going to make them understand. So I think just realizing that and realizing that at some point it's going to have to be, you know, about my feelings and maybe my immediate family, right? My husband and my kids, maybe my mom and dad, but everybody else is just going to have to sit in 
what's going on with me and figure it out themselves because I'm in their shit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I can't do it for them. Yeah. <laughs> we see though, when you're not in a mental or uh, mental, I was going to say mental health crisis, a health crisis, how we are so busy trying to manage other people's emotions. Yeah. I think even our own emotions we're trying to handle, handle right? Like, and understand, like I got an email a couple of weeks ago and I was like, how can they be communicating with me like this? And so like, then like, why am I reacting like that? Why is this triggering me? Like, and so there's a bunch of different like external inputs and other people inputs, and you just have to kind of sort through them and, and, you know, figure out what, what you need to deal with at that point. We talked a little bit about how this has influenced well, maybe the presence, like you being present with your boys and your family, what are, are you noticing like the mental, I'm going to call it skills, the effort, attention, attitude that you're acquiring, how it's helping you and is it helping you in your work as well? Yeah. I mean, I think it's helping me prioritize the things that are important. Mm -hmm. Um, it's helping me understand resistance. Like I definitely, that's helped a lot knowing what's resistance. Um, I think where it maybe hinders is like, I wish I could bring so much more of that into like a hospital environment mm -hmm. and kind of like have a more holistic experience if you can even like have that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm trying to, you know, I told my mom, look, you need to hire a Reiki healer when I'm in the hospital and have that person come in the hospital. And so I've given her all these tasks, like, this is what I'm going to need. Mm -hmm. um, because I think I've changed as a person too, right? And a lot of my, I mean, between, from when I'm 17 and now it's going to be a completely different mental journey for myself. Yeah. So uh, just trying to, create a toolbox that I can bring with me that can help me through all of that stuff. You're a badass. Simple. What did I tell you? You're just getting an upgrade. Your organ, your heart's getting promoted. You're just getting an upgrade. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime I had to do like x-rays or scans or anything, I'd be like, they're just here for the photo shoot. They're just here for the photo shoot. And it's funny because it completely shifted. Even some yeah. people's perspectives are like, oh, you have to go for that. And it's like, no, I'm like, I am so fucking sexy. My organs are so fucking sexy that they just want, they want another photo shoot. <laughs> the effort like and attitude, even though I was still scared, yeah. like, even course, though there was yeah. still fear, but I asked myself, how do I want to feel? Yeah. And how do you want to be perceived? Right. Because you, you come across so many people in the hospital. Like, I think that's another thing that I think about, like what energy do I want to project on other people? Yeah. I'm going through something really horrendous, but I don't want that to be how they see me. I want them to see me how I am. Yeah. Love it. What is the last thing that you want to say to anyone listening to, the, to this, that may be going through a challenge? What do you want them to know or experience or remember? I think any positive shift you can make for yourself is helping you live a better life. And you should do every little positive shift you can. Um, they're worth it, even the small ones. I know Heather's a, a big proponent of like small habits and those are, they help. So just, shift little things and those little things be will become bigger things yeah tiny tiny actions lead to big micro actions macro joy yeah well thank you jessica i'm excited for your next level that's the energy i'm projecting towards your way which is your um your 2.0 model that you get hope over fear right hundred percent. Are you ready to take back control of your time and energy? But the thought of where to start feels overwhelming. I created something for you. It's called the energy finder quiz. Yep. 
This quiz takes less than two minutes and it helps you identify where to focus so you can conquer your dreams without feeling like you're failing as a mother. After coaching hundreds of women, helping them reverse engineer how they want to feel in their personal and professional lives, I started to notice four hidden skills that women must master in order to create the work-life balance that they crave. So head on over to Heather Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N dot com forward slash life quiz. Heather Chauvin dot com forward slash life L I F E quiz Q U I Z and get started. I even give you specific podcast episodes to listen to based on your energy finder quiz results. The goal is to show you where to focus so you can regain your time and energy and become the woman you deeply know you are capable of becoming. HeatherChauvin.com forward slash life quiz. 